Hey everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all of my lectures and I put them on YouTube and I put all my workflows on GitHub and I made a spatial data analytics Python package I put on PyPy and and I do all of this to support my students with evergreen course content that they can use to succeed in the class and also afterwards. I also like to support working professionals. So shout out to anybody who's attending and enjoying this content. Okay, so I had a lecture that I just recently put up and it was 90 data analytics, part of the reboot where I'm improving the sound quality and the visualization and so forth. It was on spatial debiasing. And I introduced the concept of spatial debiasing. Here specifically are the course notes that I was covering around that. The idea is this, that when it comes to spatial bias in your sample set, and please assume all sparsely sampled spatial data sets are biased unless proven otherwise. Most of them are. There is this problem where we have an area of interest and we've sampled the good stuff and we never sample the not so good stuff, the bad stuff. And so we introduced the idea of clustering and declustering as a way to improve if you have higher density of samples in the good stuff and fewer samples in the low stuff. How do you count for that? This is more than that. We're actually missing part of the distribution. This is how we would display it. And in fact, we can't weight our way or use weights on the data to weight our way out of this problem because there's nothing to weight here. We're missing an entire range or component of the distribution. We cannot solve this problem unless we have some additional piece of information to help us. And that introduced the concept of using secondary data for debiasing. And so this was that example where we had some type of an anti-cline structure, which if I was to take a piece of paper and fold it, that's the shape of that structure. It could be a reservoir, whatever it is. And we have the crest of the structure is the line right along the top here. And we have sample data only there. We don't have samples along the flanks of the structure. And so all of our samples are shallow. Now, in the case of porosity and depth, we would expect that there is typically some type of porosity depth trend, i.e. a compaction trend that at lower depth or greater depth, I should say, we have lower porosity. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna use that data that's missing part of the distribution. It doesn't, it has never sampled the flanks or those lower porosity values we would expect at greater depth. We're gonna use a relationship between porosity and depth to fill in the missing information. That's the idea. So we got porosity and depth. We haven't sampled the whole distribution, but we're gonna model a relationship in order to get the rest. Okay, so what it looks like is this. We'll take the data over the range of depths we have available. We can formulate a conditional distribution of porosity given that depth range. This is our conditional distribution right here. This is the marginal distribution of depths. For the data, we're only sampling the shallow depths, and this is the marginal distribution of porosity. For the data, we're only sampling the high porosity values. We have this depth distribution at all locations. If we go back to our example, we can easily get that. This structure, we have it mapped in space, so I can go ahead and calculate for every location on this page all of the depth values everywhere. It's easy to get. That's the key thing about this methodology is the secondary data must be something we have everywhere. And we need a relationship between it and the primary thing, primary feature, I should say, porosity. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we can take that conditional distribution, form a relationship between porosity and depth, and we can then extrapolate that conditional. So imagine taking this conditional distribution right here, and just, we could just go ahead, if we select it, and we could copy and paste it. And we could put it down here, centered on that trend line, and we could put it right here, centered on that trend line. And if we do that enough, we get this full set of conditional distributions for different bins of depth, 
assuming that depth trend is reasonable. Now you notice the data doesn't support that because we had no data down here. It's not a data fit. It's using some type of engineering geoscience knowledge to be able to impose that. Maybe analog settings where we have knowledge about that behavior. Okay, once we've done that, it's pretty straightforward because we have these conditional distributions for a variety of ranges of depths. So we have conditional distributions of porosity given each one of those. So with those, now what we could do is we could apply this operator, the integration over depth of the conditional porosity given depth multiplied by, or I like to think about it as weighted by the marginal of depth. In other words, if a conditional comes from the center, like the mode of the depth distribution, it should have more influence because there's more frequency here. And if we have a conditional distribution out here on this tail, it would have very little impact. The result is we're effectively, we're going to be integrating over depth, taking all those conditionals weighted by the marginal of depth, and we will now get a porosity marginal corrected. We get the green curve. Okay, so that's the fundamental idea. Let me show you how it would work in Excel with this idea of binning by depths. Okay, so we gave ourselves a data set. Now I'm not gonna plot the scatter plot of the data. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to show you the binned conditional probabilities. Okay, so we have a set of depth intervals. And so we've got depth going from 5,000 to 5,250 meters, 5,250 meters to 5,500 meters, and so forth, all the way down to 7,250 meters. We have data available for the shallowest depths, 5,000 to 5,250 meters. And when we take that data and we calculate the conditional distribution given that range, this bend up, this is the conditional distribution of porosity given that range. That's the only place we have data. We're just calculating that binned up. It's a normalized histogram, right? Because it's telling you the probability of being within each one of those bins. Okay, so we can see if we were to plot it up and look at that, this is what it looks like, is we have zero probability of having porosities lower than something about 14%. Uh, and then we have this kind of increasing and decreasing. It looks symmetric. You can see by the color coding, it's symmetric and so forth. Okay, now what we can do is let's extrapolate that relationship to deeper depths. Now we'll do that right here. So anybody who's worked with my Excel sheets knows that I have one rule and one rule only. You're only allowed to touch the yellow cells. You can change those. If you change any other cells, I have no idea what you're doing anymore. Please don't email me and ask me to try to fix it because you something's probably messed up. So let's just stick with the yellow cells. Okay, now what I've done for fun is I've given you the ability to control through a Gaussian distribution, the mean and standard deviation, so the entire conditional distribution. You can then set the coefficient for this bivariate trend, which is that extrapolation of the conditionals to the other depth ranges. And then what I've done is I've said you can also change the distribution of depths over the entire reservoir. And so what I did is I set it as 6,000 meters is the mean, it's Gaussian again, and 300 standard deviation, plus or minus three standard deviations. We're talking about a range of about 5,000 to about 7,000. So we got a Gaussian distribution of possible depths like that. Now let me refer back to this figure in the course notes and explain these parameters one more time. And so in this case, we're working with, I'll go to this figure right here. We have the conditional distribution of porosity given the shallow depths, which I've shown here are just between 5,000 and 5,250. We can input it and build this conditional Gaussian distribution. So we change those values, we'll change that distribution up or down. This bivariate trend is going to be how much of a shift would we expect as we go from bin to bin to bin in the average porosity of that, of that distribution. And so we can formulate the conditional distribution down here in the next bin and the conditional distribution in the next bin and so forth. And if you look at the Excel spreadsheet, you can see that's exactly what we did is we have multiple bins, conditional distributions. Since the bivariate trend has a slope of zero, it's the same distribution, repeat, repeat, repeat. 
Okay, so what we have to do next is we have to calculate the joint probability. We've got to go from a marginal of depth, which we specified a Gaussian distribution for, and the conditionals, we have to turn it into a joint. How are we going to do that? That's exactly what we do over here. We calculate the joint distribution by just taking the product of the conditional porosity given depth multiplied by the marginal of depth. And so if we do that, what's really cool is you see this original conditionals. If you're doing that, remember this depth is, is based on a Gaussian distribution that would look like that. And so the joint probabilities of being in each of these cells is simply going to be a demotion on these tails of high or large depth and shallow depth. So you can see their joint probabilities are pretty low and higher joint probability in the middle because that's the mode of the depth distribution. Okay, now that we have joint probabilities, we can do a very simple marginalization. And that's exactly what's shown here in the remainder of the equation, this idea of an integration or a summing over these. So the result of this is going to be joints, but because we integrate over depth over joints, and we've already shown that in a previous lecture, we get the marginal of porosity. If you remember the example we did in class, all we're gonna do is take all of the joint probabilities and sum the rows. And that's exactly how that we're going to calculate the debiased marginal distribution for porosity. Now this was the original biased one, and we're just plotting them bend over different values of porosity going from one to 40% porosity. But you'll notice they're exactly the same. The biased and the debiased are exactly the same. Why is that? Because we're performing this operation with a zero trend in the depth porosity relationship. So let's go ahead now and try changing this value to be a negative bivariate trend. That's our, we're, we're modeling a linear relationship over increasing depth, a change in the mean of the conditional distributions. Now, so I put a negative one here. So for each one of these bins, I'm having a shift in the mean of about negative one porosity unit. And the result is, look at the shift, 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 shift. And so all of the conditional distributions are shifting down. So effectively what we've done, if we go back to this plot right here, we've decided to say that we have this linear negative trend as depth increases, the conditional distributions are all shifting. And now when we perform our calculation of the joint, look at the joint now. And when we marginalize by summing over the rows, this is what we get now, the original biased one here, and now our new debiased porosity marginal distribution is shown right here, and you can see the shift in that distribution. Now, it's easier to visualize the distribution by looking at its plot. These binned values of the normalized probabilities. So let's go ahead and take a look at the plot. So we have the original naive distribution shown here in light gray, and this is the debiased. Look at that, isn't that great? We've now calculated using the conditional distribution that we had available from the data, using depth information that we had available at all locations within the subsurface, and using this model of a depth porosity trend, we've now calculated an updated marginal distribution that's now shifted down. And so the debiased sample mean is now 16.5. The original naive sample mean was 20%. We were really overestimating the porosity. Now, of course, this is, this, this is gonna be sensitive to what you decide to do as far as the depth trend. Let's just take it back, just to visualize this change. Take it back, you see how we just went back to naive. So our model is now the naive 20%, 20%, they're the same we went negative one. Okay, so 16.5%. What happens if we go negative two? Look how steep that's getting. And now look what happened. We have a D bias sample mean of 13%. That model of the trend is really impactful on this result. So you need to have good, a good understanding of that, a good defense of that choice, okay? Um, if we increase it even more, 
you can see what happens and it keeps shifting down when we perform the marginalization of the joints we calculate here we're shifting that distribution down quite a bit and changing it quite a bit what happens if i change it to a positive value well that would be like saying that with greater depth we have greater porosity not typically what we'd expect due to the physics of compaction in the subsurface but who knows it might be some type of systematic change in lithology explaining that so i'll stop right there you can go ahead and download if you haven't already this spreadsheet from my github account and go ahead and play with spatial debiasing get a little experiential learning with it it's not too complicated but remember it's a very powerful methodology it allows you to go beyond the data incorporate geoscience engineering physics or knowledge or concepts into your model through this extrapolation of the conditional distributions to fill in missing information the secondary information in this case depth must be easier to get than the primary piece of information porosity which was sparsely sampled only in the shallow depths we must be able to calculate the depths at all possible locations in the area of interest and we must know something about the relationship between the two and we can use that to map our way to a better marginal distribution of the primary variable of interest porosity in this case we go from here to here we filled in the missing part of the distribution using this relationship all right i hope that this was helpful to everybody I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I conduct research and teach on data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. If anybody's interested in collaborating, if you're working for a company and you'd like to gain new skills, learn more about these technologies and how you can use it to add value, go ahead and reach out to me. We do all kinds of collaboration with a wide range of different companies all for the purpose of supporting students and providing excellent practical experience and building competencies out in our industry. All right, I'm always happy to help out. And um, everyone, take care.